Well, good morning, church. Uh, it's good to see you, uh, virtually anyway. Um, if you're joining us on Facebook or on YouTube, we're glad you found us. Uh, our prayer is that once all of this is over, this COVID-19 uh, social distancing is over, uh, that you'll come find us on Nine Mile Road in Pensacola. We'd love to have you at one of our worship gatherings to get to meet you. Church, I hope by now you've either seen or heard the message from our, from our elders concerning our coming back together uh, for worship next week on the 17th. I'm so excited we're going to be back together again. Um, although it's not going to be quite the same, uh, we will have social distancing guidelines in place and we're going to do everything we can possible to make sure that everyone stays safe. You'll be getting an email this week confirming uh, that your family will either be attending the 9 a.m. or the 11 a.m. service. I'm just so looking forward to seeing you all in person next week. Uh, but also rest assured, if, if you're uncomfortable still getting out, uh, if the thought of coming together at the building still causes you anxiety or fear, uh, our elders are, are, are suggesting, requesting that you just stay home. Uh, our services will still be live streamed. The 9 a.m. service will be live streamed uh, on Facebook as it always has been in the past. So you can always access it there. And I'd ask this, please remain in prayer uh, for our shepherds, for our staff, uh, as we navigate through these upcoming changes and, and the best way to handle them for everybody concerned. For all you mothers out there today, happy Mother's Day. Uh, before I get much further into this, I do, I do just want to acknowledge uh, a fact. Uh, when Mother's Day comes around and Father's Day comes around, it's, it's a happy day uh, for most people. But I do want to acknowledge that, that for everyone, it's not necessarily a day to celebrate. And there are many reasons why uh, that might be the case, but we just want you to know that we, we understand and we acknowledge. For me, myself, this is my first mother's day without my own mother so i i understand that sometimes the feelings uh, aren't necessarily positive but at the same time we do want to celebrate the godly mothers that have blessed our lives and are and are still blessing the lives of their children and we have many many here who are doing just that so let's begin our worship together this morning with a prayer please join me our Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for your care, uh, for your attention, for your love that you pour out on us daily. And this morning, Father, I just want to lift up to you all the mothers uh, that are watching, and, and my prayer is that you will continue to bless their lives as they bless the lives of their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and all those that come into contact with them. Give them the strength and the wisdom and the discernment and the love and the compassion and the patience that's needed to, to be the kind of mother you would want them to be. Father, my prayer is for us as a congregation as we seek to come back together physically uh, next week, and I, I pray your blessing on all those who are involved in making plans and preparations that we can do so in a way that will be safe and and at the same time, still provide an atmosphere and an opportunity to glorify you in all that we do. This morning, Father, I ask your blessing on our time together. We seek to come together uh, in spirit as your body, to lift you up in praise, to honor your word, and pray that you will be glorified and magnified through all that we do. And it's through Christ we pray. Amen. As we begin this time uh, of reflection uh, around the table, uh, I first want to take you to a couple of passages, and then I have a few comments I'd like to make on them, but I want to read those first. And the first one is, is in Matthew chapter 26, uh, verses 27 and 28. It says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I'd like, if you would, turn over to Luke chapter 22. 
Luke chapter 22. Listen to this, verse 20. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you. It is the new covenant in my blood. You know, when when Jesus says, This is my blood, there are some who, who take that literally to believe that 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 fruit of the vine, that juice and that cup was actually is now the actual blood of Christ. But but I really believe that Jesus is figuratively talking about his blood here. It represents Jesus' blood. It is not his actual physical blood. And and if you still have doubts, maybe interpreting this word is that way, maybe if we take it a little step further, maybe it'll erase those doubts. On that very same occasion, Jesus made another statement where that word or concept is obviously means to represent or to stand for. That was when he said, this cup, which is poured out for you, obviously meaning the contents of the cup. But he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This cup is the new covenant. In what sense was the cup... A covenant. <coughs> well, first we have to ask, what is a covenant? Basically, the word when used in Bible times spoke of a contract between two or more people or parties. It was a mutual promise or pledge. It was a pact or an agreement that was officially accepted by both parties. The essence of a covenant is what each person promises to do. And what Jesus is promising to do under this new covenant that he mentions in Luke 22, well, Matthew records it this way. He says, this is my blood of the covenant, listen, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. The the essence of the new covenant from God's perspective is that he promises to forgive your sins. That's what the blood of Jesus was shed for. It allows God to forgive your sins and still be righteous and just. But one more thing I need to point out. A covenant is mutual. It's a two-way agreement involving, involving promises from both sides, something like a wedding ceremony. In the new covenant established by Christ's blood, God promises that he will forgive our sins. But the question this morning is, what are we promising to God? In that moment, when we enter into covenant relationship with God, what are our terms? What are we promising to keep? Well, I believe we are promising to to love and to trust and to serve Jesus forever. We make that promise when we are preparing to enter the waters of, of baptism. And in that act, the two promises come together. You see, so, so what are we doing now here at the Lord's table? Well, for one thing, we are, in essence, renewing our covenant vows to love, to trust, to serve Jesus forever. We are remembering God's promise to, to us and, and thanking him for it, the forgiveness of our sins made possible by the pouring out of the blood of Jesus. And we are promising again to serve Jesus even if it requires all of us. Think on that this morning as we partake. Think on this as a renewal of your vows with God. Let's pray now for the bread. Our Father, as we come before your table this morning, we we see the bread which represents your son's body. And, And in it, Father, we see the covenant that you have established with us. And Father, for that, we, we don't deserve even to be in covenant with you, but we are glad and thankful that we are. This morning, as we partake of this bread, Father, help us to remember not only your promise to us, but our promise to you as well. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Let's pray now for the cup. Father, as we again come before you, we 
we see this cup of juice and we know, Father, that it represents your son's blood. And that blood, Father, represents the covenant between us, the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And, and help us, Father, to reflect on the amazing amount of love it took for you to allow your son to die for us. And it's through Christ we pray. Amen. Hopefully we won't have to do this much longer, but I do want to keep it in front of you. Um, you still have an opportunity, and you will always have an opportunity to give through the Give Plus app uh, or by going online at scenichillcoc.org to our website. Uh, you can access that there. Um, just, just so you will know, next week we'll have boxes outside. We won't be passing a tray, so to speak, during our worship service, but there'll be a place for you to deposit your contribution uh, next week. Or, of course, you can always, always do it online. Last week, we, we began taking a look at the 23rd Psalm and the activities of the shepherd, especially as they relate to God as our shepherd. And last week we saw all of the ways in which our godly shepherd provides for us. There are so many ways that he provided through relationship, through replenishment, through rest, through restoration, uh, through righteousness. This week I want to continue on in Psalm 23 and look at another activity of the shepherd. And as I mentioned before beginning, today is also Mother's Day. And this week as I was studying through this, my mind kept going back uh, to my own mother. And and in every action that, we, that, that we'll talk about, I, I kept seeing the actions of mother. And I think as we work through this, we'll not only see the attributes of, of God as our shepherd, but we'll also see the attributes of a godly mother as well. I know some of you mothers probably feel like a shepherd at times, maybe more so today, especially if your herd has been in your house for a long time. Maybe you're trying to herd cats, as the expression goes, but... As we go through this, I really think we can see and relate to God, not only as shepherd, but as parent, father, mother even. So let's read the whole psalm together again, and then we'll come back and unpack it. Psalm 23, 1 through 6. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, before we dive into this wholly again, I want to keep a simple statement in front of you uh, we talked about it last week, and I think it's significant as we work through this. And it's simply this. If you want the calm of the psalm, then you must become one of the shepherd's sheep. Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we walk through this together today. You know, when we come to verse 4, we see a couple of changes. In verses 1 through 3 of the psalm, the sheep, they're out in the sunshine. They're, they're in the green pastures. They're beside the still waters. Life is good. Life is normal. But when we get to verse 4, the sheep have been moved. In verse 4, they're in the shadows, and it's, it's not bright and sunny anymore. As a matter of fact, the psalmist alludes to the fact that it's dark and it's, it's scary. But we, we need to see through this that, that God not only provides for us through the good times, the sunny light, the green pastures, but, but he also adds to his provision protection. You see, when the difficult times come, He still leads us. He still shepherds us, whether through the sun or through the dark valleys of life. I want you to notice how the pronouns change. 
You know, in the first half of the psalm, David, David is singing the virtues of the shepherd, and he's using he and his as he refers to Yahweh, to God. But when we come to the second half, he speaks to the shepherd more personally. As a matter of fact, he says, you are with me, your rod, your staff, you prepare, you anoint. You see, I believe that's because when tough times come, God becomes more real. And I think for David, God became more real to him. Have you ever experienced that in your own life? You know, this COVID-19 thing really isn't anything new. And I know you're saying, yes, it is. But maybe how we've had to respond to it is new. But we've faced pandemics before, and, and most likely we will again. And I'd offer a guess that, that most of you weren't free from problems before the COVID-19 thing broke out. I mean, problems in life didn't just appear when COVID-19 appeared. They've been around and will still be around after this whole thing is over. And we need to see and know that our God, our shepherd, will be there with us during these times. And the promise we see from Psalms 23 is a promise not only of provision, but also of protection. The first activity of protection that I see that God protects us by is simply this. The shepherd protects by replacing fear with peace. Look at the first part of, of verse 4. He says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You know, that phrase, even though, can be translated even then or even when. And the idea is simply this. We will go through valleys like we are right now with this whole COVID thing. The picture here is of the shepherd leading his sheep down through maybe rocky ravines or through narrow gorges where the, the shadows would cover the trail. The mere presence of shadows as sheep are moving and, and things are moving around would often frighten sheep. And the experienced shepherd knows this is also where predators like to set up for ambush. But notice what he says. We walk through the valley. We don't have to stay there. We don't camp there. It's not our chosen destination. So we must keep walking, following in order to make it to the green pasture, sometimes we have to go through some pretty scary valleys. You know, in one sense, the shadow of something is actually more ominous than what it actually represents. On the other hand, the shadow of a dog can't bite us. And the shadow of death cannot harm us if we stay close to the shepherd. But always remember this. Where there is shadow there must also be light. Don't miss that God leads us through the shadows just as he brings us into the promised land. Notice, the, notice that David <laughs> describes this place not as the valley of death. He doesn't describe it as the valley of death. This valley is the shadow of death. This is so important for the Christian to wrap your head around. 1 Corinthians 15.55 reminds us that, that Jesus has removed the sting of death. Now only the shadow remains. And, and this is a beautiful thought when you think about it. If there's a shadow of death, that simply means there's light on the other side of death. 1 Corinthians 15.55 reminds us death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Listen to these passages. Jesus in John 8, 51 tells us, Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. And John eleven twenty six, 26, Jesus says this, Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? You know, just like a mother who who calms her child during a thunderstorm or holds her child's hand in a strange place or, or in a crowd of strangers, we can know the protection from fear from our godly shepherd. And it gives us a sense of peace and calm. You know, but he does more than that. God also protects us by his companionship. And what I mean by that is simply this. Because we are in relationship with God, because the sheep are in relationship with the shepherd, companionship happens. 
David can deal with the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Because his companion is with him. He says in verse 4, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. You see, the shepherd goes before us when the path is clean and clear, but he stands beside us when the path is rocky and it's scary. There's an antidote for for anxiety or fear in Psalm 16.8. It simply says this, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, close, and I shall not be shaken. Matt Chandler uh, again says it this way, The promise we get here is not a life without pain. It's that in our pain, regardless of what that pain is, he will be with us. Jesus' promise to be present with us is echoed in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, where the Hebrew writer says this of Jesus, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? But David continues. He doesn't leave it there. He continues within this relationship context when he says, your rod and your staff, they bring comfort to me. Now the rod, as used by a shepherd, was used to protect the sheep. Shepherds were very adept in their aim and would throw this club-like rod at attacking animals. The staff, on the other hand, was a very tall, slender pole and had a little crook at the end. You've all seen them. But it could be hooked around the leg of a sheep to pull it from harm, or it could be utilized to lift a sheep up out of a crevasse that it had fallen into. Understand, the rod was a tool of the shepherd that was used to confront enemies, while the staff was used to show care. Together, working in concert, the rod and the staff, the rod provided a source of protection, and the staff communicated a safe and reassuring presence. The rod was tough. The staff was loving. I'm told a shepherd would use the rod with his sheep on on two occasions. One was to help him count the sheep as they would come back into the fold. As they would pass under the rod, he would make sure none of them were missing. And the other was sometimes he would use the rod to discipline sheep when, when nothing else worked. As I was reading this this week, I, I thought back, my mom, my mother had a rod. Uh, it was a wooden, wooden paddle given to her um, from one of the principals that she had been secretary for. Um, it had an inscription on that piece of wood. Uh, it said, heat for the seat. It was her rod of correction, so to speak, for her extremely stubborn little lamb. You know, we still see God using both as shepherd, don't we? And he uses his shepherding tools, though, within the context of a loving relationship, just like a mother would. Loving, yet tough, when she needs to be with us, or when he needs to be. When we're stubborn sheep, Sometimes we may need the rod. Sometimes when we get out of line, we may need the staff to be brought back. But through it all, it's for our own good. It's for our own protection. Now, the third way I see the shepherd protecting us is is through preparation. In verse 5, I think think you can see this. David writes this. He says, "'You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies.'" Some suggest David here is switching metaphors to that of a, a, the gracious host at a dinner party, so to speak. And there might be something to that, but, but he could be using a very common expression to describe what a shepherd does to, to prepare a pasture. You know, ideally the best place for a sheep or a herd of sheep to graze is on a flat mesa, a table-like piece of ground. One that was free of, uh, of trees, but, but had nice pasture in the middle. But before letting the lambs romp around, the, the shepherd would inspect it. He would go through to make sure there weren't any harmful plants, any poisonous plants. He would also check to make sure that there were no predators in the vicinity. And that they were off so that he could keep an eye on and, and watch the approaches from all sides to protect his sheep. And in one sense, you see a picture of sheep on this, this flat table type top kind of land with the shepherd watching and there may be ferocious 
uh, animals off to the side, hiding down in the woods. But with the shepherd looking on, he has prepared for them a place where they can even eat, even in the presence of their enemies. You know, we all know what mama bear can look like, especially when her cubs are in danger. Those are some claws you don't want to see, you don't want to mess with, right moms? Reminds me of a young boy who was, who was messing around during dinner. And after being warned several times to stop, his parents finally told him, okay, if you're not going to behave, you're going to have to go eat over there in the corner by yourself. So they take his plate and they put it over on a little tiny table in the corner. He's going to eat by himself. And, and as he begins to eat, his father turns to him and says, don't forget to pray for your food. So the little boy closed his eyes and he bowed his head and he said, bless this food that I eat in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> you ever feel like that sometimes, baby? Understand that word enemy here in Psalm 23 can mean to, to bind up or to tie up or to be distressed, to be troubled, to be oppressed, to be cramped. Rest assured, the shepherd prepares us, keeps us safe during the good and during the bad. But he also, protect, he also protects us through, through prevention. The middle of verse 5 is, is so rich in meaning, and there's so many different ways that you can go with it, but, but simply says, you anoint my head with oil. Now, if David is referring to a dinner party, as some suggest, uh, he has in mind the, the, the generous host who would put fragrant oil on his guests as they arrived. This would help neutralize the body odor of being out in an arid climate. Okay, uh, And you can imagine that type of odor could spoil dinner, especially if you were reclined together. Okay, In our culture, it would be like as your guests arrived, you were handing out... Um, a stick of deodorant as they came through the door. I, I don't recommend that today, by the way. I don't think it will be received in the same way David might have meant it back then. All right. But also in that day, oil was, was a sign of rejoicing. And, and so to be anointed with it was to be splashed with joy, so to speak. And, and while some of those explanations may shed some light on the meaning of this text, I, I still go back to the fact that David is a shepherd. And the majority, if not all, of this text is within the context of the sheep and shepherd relationship. You know, in ancient Israel, and even still today, shepherds used oil for at least three different purposes on, on their sheep. The first was, was to prevent and repel insects. Didn't know this, but sheep are really bother, bothered by bugs, especially flies. And the flies like to deposit their eggs in the, the tender membranes of a sheep's nose. Now, you can imagine what happens when, and I, and I know this may get graphic, but I, you can imagine what happens then when those fly eggs hatch, which create maggots inside the nose of a sheep. To some extent, it could drive these lambs insane. They would beat their heads against trees and against rocks, trying to get rid of, of what was in their nose. So, so shepherds would, would put oil on their heads, especially around their, their muzzles, to keep the flies from, from laying their legs, eggs there. They also used it to prevent conflict. You see, oil was used to prevent injury to rams as they butted heads over a ewe. A shepherd would smear the oil onto the horns and onto their heads. So when they would hit, they would simply glide off each other instead of splitting their craniums wide open. Another way, they would use it as uh, an ointment to prevent infection. Oil was also used because sheep got all kinds of little cuts and abrasions by walking around in a pasture from thorns, from rocks. And that oil would act as a salve to prevent infection and speed up the healing process. You know, God describes himself in the same way in Exodus 15 when he said, I am the Lord, your healer. You know, what a beautiful picture of what the shepherd does for, his, for us, for his sheep. He deals with our problems by, by protecting us from those things that can wipe us out, drive us crazy. He helps us live in harmony with others and he comforts and heals us when we're beat up. We're wounded sheep in need of a healing shepherd. I'd ask you, do you have any wounds today? You know, I totally see my mother in this activity. 
She was a secretary for an elementary school for the most part of her life, all that I can remember, till she retired. She always said that she said she might have been a secretary, but she was known more as the Band Aid Lady. Because the little guys would come in after playing on recess or whatnot, little knees all skinned up, and man, they would run right into mom and they'd jump up in her lap. And she'd put her arms around them and she'd comfort them just like a mother would. And she'd get a band aid out and clean it up and put it on and send them on their way. But you know, she did the same for me <laughs> many, many, many times. And you know, many times the only medication needed is a simple kiss from mom to make it all better. But you know, the truth of a mother's love and protection are the same for the love and protection of the godly shepherd. You have to be in proximity to the shepherd in order to receive the protection of the shepherd. The truth I've, the truth I've wanted to keep in front of you is still just as important at the end as it was in the beginning. If you want the calm of the psalm, you must become one of the shepherd's sheep. Do you want the protection of the shepherd in your life, in your family's lives? Do you want to experience the calm of the godly shepherd? Then do what you need to do to become one of his sheep or return to the fold. We'll talk more about that next week. When we're all together, God bless. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the technology that we have, that we can be together in, in spirit, if not in person. And Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we're going to have next week to be together in person. We pray for your protection during that time. Father, we love the fact that you are our shepherd. And I know sometimes we can be stubborn sheep. And I pray that, that through this psalm, through David's words, that we will be convicted to understand just how important it is for us to remain close to you. And Father, again, for the mothers in attendance, I ask your blessing on them as they, like you, continue to provide and protect for their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, for all of those children who come into their lives. Father, we love them and we thank you for them. My prayer is for your blessing on them. Father, bless us all. Take our pride out of the way so that we can readily submit to you as shepherd. It's through Christ we pray. Amen.